Um, so my talk is on evil by design. My name is Chef Klaas. You can find me on Twitter. I have a blog where I've been writing for eight years or so. Um, straight out of school, I started working for a company where they build software for fire departments, which was an interesting project. In a retrospect, it was a crazy interesting domain, but you know, a bit younger, a bit more naive. I was mostly obsessed with technology, which made me move into consultancy, where I worked for a few bigger companies doing banking and postal services. But after a few years, I really got tired of big companies, and I think a lot of people feel that way. So now, these days, I'm working in a very small team. It's basically four to five to six people, and there's quite a lot of responsibility, quite some freedom, and we happen to be building software for an online gambling domain. So I'll start with giving you a small introduction on the birth of this project. So my employer, when I joined the company two years ago, he owned several smaller neighborhood casinos in Belgium. And these aren't the big casinos you would see in movies or the ones you find in the heart of Brussels. There's one big casino in Brussels. These are the smaller gambling halls, so neighborhood casinos. So due to the law, they're, they're not allowed to do a lot of fancy stuff, um, they're very simple by nature. So if you've never visited one, first of all, you would go to a registration area where they will check whether you're allowed to gamble in Belgium, yes or no. So that's a bit domain specific, I guess. But once you're inside, you'll just see a big room that's filled with machines, like slot machines or dice games or automated roulettes. And furthermore, you have some generic services, like being able to withdraw money, to deposit money. There are some food and some beverages, but that's basically it. It's very simple. And even if you look at what goes on in the back end, behind the scenes, it's all pretty generic. I mean, they do have some bills to pay. They have human resources, but it's not domain specific. It's something we've been doing for years and years. <coughs> so the first version of the website I'm now working on was basically a copy of this thing. You had a registration area. We had, at that time, 15 games. Um, you could make a deposit. You could request a withdrawal. And that was basically it. There were some gimmicks, but they were implemented very badly. There wasn't put any thought to them. So when this website went online, so in Belgium, um, we only have like legalized online gambling for two years now. When we went online, it became very obvious after a few months or even after a few weeks that things weren't really working out. So we were a casino, but we weren't making any money, which is not the goal, of course. Now, um, the problem is that we had those domain experts who had that experience running those smaller neighborhood casinos. And what's important there, first of all, you need to have a license. Plus, you need to have the permission of the city you have your casino in that you can have a casino in their city. So the location is your most important asset there. Now, of course, moving online, this becomes trivial. OK, a domain name is still important, but not that it's not that important, your location anymore. And basically, you would see that you, as a customer, you can migrate to a different casino basically in one minute. You just fill in the registration form and you're done. We lost a customer. So we now compare ourselves much more with a, with a casino on the Las Vegas Strip where you have like 50 or 60 casinos competing for customers in one street. So it's a totally different ball game. Now if you look at those bigger casinos, those casinos at the Las Vegas Strip, you'll see that they have a lot more going on. If, you, if you're just a regular customer and you visit them the first time, you'll also see this registration area, those games. You can do a deposit, request a withdrawal. But that if, if you see a bit more, if you see what goes behind the scenes, you'll see a lot more systems and models at play there. 
Just think of the effort they put in marketing or customer attention, loyalty, security. They have so much more going on. So when we realize this, um, I think at the time we were drinking or we saw everything very clear. We said, okay, we have those domain experts, but they're not really domain experts anymore because this business changes completely. So we said, if we want to make this thing we're working on a success, and it should be fun for us as well, we want to build software that's being used, we should try to become domain experts ourselves. So we kind of went on a journey, on a trip. So basically, this meant that we, we started out window shopping. We went shopping for language, for models. What I did is I started reading books on how casinos work, how physical, larger, those big Las Vegas casinos, how do they do their business? And I started reading research papers on how the human psyche works on gambling. While I was doing that, my colleagues, they actually, they started visiting the websites of our competitors. They registered, they clicked around a little bit, but eventually they deposited some money. They started playing, they started asking questions. And what they got out of that is, in retrospect, much more valuable because they really hustled for that knowledge. They now have, they came back with street knowledge while I only had that book knowledge. But anyway, when we came back, we acquired a set of language, a set of models, but we also had a feel of the systems at play to run, um, you need to have to run a successful casino. So we then drew this map, and basically what we saw is that we had a lot of work ahead of us. The problem though is that we're only four to five people, so we can't build this all, all ourselves. So we there made a very conscious decision on which things do we need to build ourselves, what's really important, because the gambling domain, there are a lot of products available, things you can buy off the shelf. So we said, we can buy this, we can buy that, but these two things, we really want to own them ourselves. For example, everything that covers player data, player behavior, that's something we want to own, and this allows us to have a nice clean model where we just put some anti-corruption layers around and we can do all types of integrations like with games or sports or um, deposit services and so on. The next thing we saw is that we want to be really good at promotions, at bonuses, loyalty. That's where you as a casino you try to make a difference because for example we started out building our own games which was a process of two years but we now have 1,000 games and we haven't written any of them ourselves. For each casino, they have the same games. It's not your core domain. It's basically trivial now. You just do an integration with a company which focuses on building games and in two weeks, you have 500 games extra. So having gone through this process for the last two years, um, I picked up quite a lot. It was a really interesting job actually. So I came here today with three topics. The first one is I want to look at some of the basic casino models, like for example, how does a game work and how do casinos make money of these games? I want to look at how we inherited like a legacy application which was completely stateful and to break things apart, we wanted to go to a more event-driven approach. How we went at that plus what we learned from looking at these events. And the third part is how do I feel about the ethics of working in this domain after two years? Basically, have I been corrupted already or not? So you will be the judge probably. Um, so the first thing are games. So I guess most people have seen a slot machine or they've played it. But not a lot of people necessarily know how slot machines work. I mean, even if they've played it, they, they've just pushed that button and they didn't really know what the things were that, were that was going on. So this is a screenshot of one of the first games the company built themselves. 
Um, it's five years old. You can see this. It's basically a copy of a physical slot machine. So playing this game, you would push this red button, which is a roll, or the spin button. And you'll see that these reels here with these dies on them, they will start spinning until they hit their stopping point. And at that point in time, you need to look at these green lines, which are called the win lines. And on these win lines, you need to look for a certain combination of dice, which then again translate into certain points. And these points will eventually translate into a multiplier. So for example, if you had a stake of one euro, you bet that one euro and you earn a multiplier of eight, this would mean that you, the machine will give you eight euros in return. So you had a net win of seven euros. So this is a very simple implementation. Um, there are a lot of variations. For example, this is a game you would feature when it's summer. This one got relevant again last year, although it's from the first movie, but uh, it got relevant again. This one is one of the latest Guns N' Roses slot machine, which is the best designed slot machine I've ever seen. The animations are insane, and it has the music, it has everything. Um, and these designers, they also run out of inspiration. I don't know, this doesn't make any sense at all. Machine Gun Unicorn, it's extremely annoying. The music, it's all very annoying. <laughs> but anyway, um, you'll see that the games in themselves, they all look alike. I mean, the animations, the artwork is different. And, but at their core, the model is all, it's quite similar for each game. So what we will be building is something that also, I've put a lot of time and effort in the artwork. Don't, it's a pretty game, right? So basically, it's not really a slot machine, but it's, I consider it a game of chance. So you have these six boxes, and when you play this game, you'll see an X going <coughs> over each one of these boxes until that X stops somewhere. Depending on where it stops, you will lose or you will win. And I should have a video. And that's my game. It's, the artwork is perfect. So you'll see that I hit that white box and I lost. So of course, I'll play again. I already invested one euro. I play again and now I win. I hit that red box, which is a winning box with a multiplier of six. So I didn't include any code. I'm just um, going to show you the model I use mentally. Um, so first off, for these games, everything needs to be random. So what we will do is we will generate a random number from one up to six. And this will decide for us which box will be hit. So for example, number one, if I generate number one, I will hit that yellow box. Simple enough. We then need to give each box a certain value. For example, the red one is the winning box. This is the only winning box which gives me a multiplier of six, and all these other boxes are losing boxes. So that should be simple enough. Let's just go over two scenarios. I hit that green box. I lost, meaning that I generated number two, which maps to that green box, which is a losing box. If I hit that red box and I have a multiplier, this means that I generated number three, hit that red box, which is a winning box. So that's simple enough, I think. Now, we, let's say that we wrote this game. We want to look at some basic model. We want to see if this game is profitable or not. So this game is simple. We can do this theoretically. But in practice, what you see is that a lot of these companies that run simulations, if you have a function like this, it's not expensive to play your game a few million times. So let's say that I played my game 10 million times. What we then want to do is we want to look at the distribution of those hits. And what you will see is that, so logically, we generated six random numbers. It's truly random. And over time, you'll see that each box gets hit one out of six times, statistically. <coughs> 
the next thing we, we want to do, and this is more interesting for the casino, is we want to see, is the player losing or is he winning money? And this is the, one of the most used terms in the casino world, is the payout. So what is the payout? It's the stati statistical value or statistical amount you will get in return for each bet a player places. So for, and you would do this, you take all of his bets, you take all of his wins, the sum of those amounts, you divide the wins by the bets and you'll get a percentage. For example, 97%. And this would mean that statistical for each euro a player puts in, he will get 97 cents in return. And this is not the term that casinos use necessarily. This is from a player's perspective, from a casino's perspective, you talk about the house edge. How much of an edge does the casino or the house have over <coughs> each bet a player makes? And that calculation is similar. Take a sum of all the bets, all the wins, and now you divide the bets by the wins. So if I would have a payout of 97%, I would have a house edge of 3%. So looking at our game, there are some bad news for the casino. We have a house edge of 0%, while the payout is 100%. So this means that if a player can cover large enough variance, if his stack is deep enough, he can play forever, while the casino isn't making any money. So this player will be able to get the free drinks, get the free food at the casino, and he isn't making any money for the casino. So we can fix that, of course. Let's look at reality. We don't want the payout of 100%. We want to make some money. So changing this is pretty simple. We will just change that multiplier to be 5 instead of 6. The simple solution, right? So we play our game again, and we now see that the casino has a house edge of 16%, while the payout is only 84%. So that's great. The casino is making money. But on the other hand, we now see that the players stop playing this game because it's very obvious that they're losing money. So what you want to do is you, you want to change this game so that it gets more exciting, maybe more addictive for players. So casinos have invented this wonderful term called near misses. So what the law defines is that everything needs to be truly random. So you need to have those random number generators. That's something which the government checks. Is your random number generator truly random? But what the law doesn't define is how you map those numbers to your machine or to your screen. So there's a lot of freedom there. So what we can do is, if this is the existing model, we can create near misses. And how you would do that, it's also simple, is you would map numbers 1 and 2 to green, four, five, and six to blue. And if you now look at this distribution, you'll see that the player is very close to winning. And this basically changes everything because now a player doesn't feel as if he's losing, he feels as if he's close to winning, which is a very different feeling. And this is a way that casinos abuse how humans work. I mean, as a programmer, it's the same thing. I write a set of tests, I have 10 tests, and one is red. I'm probably not going home before I get that last test to pass. When we're close to something, we get obsessed by it. It's the same thing if, if I'm practicing um, basketball or whatever, and I'm always missing, I'm always missing, but I'm getting closer, so I get a bit obsessed because I'm close to that target. And that's how we've, as humans, been successful in the past because we get obsessed to getting close to our goal. So um, we see that this game is more immersive for a player, and we still have that same house edge and that same payout. So in my game, the payout is only 84%. If you look at the real values, online casinos, they aim somewhere between 95 and 98. It depends on the casino. For example, if you go to a place with a lot of tourists, let's say Las Vegas, they have more costs, they have more never returning players, they make the payout 90%, for example. But online, it's generally 
somewhere around that. So when I talk to people and I say, well, we had a payout of 98% last month, which was exceptionally high, and I don't explain it well enough, those people say, okay, so you mean that if I deposit 100 euros, I play the whole evening in your casino and I will leave your casino with 98 euros? And this is where people get it wrong. They don't understand the cumulative nature of the payout. It's statistical you're losing for each bet you make. So to make sense of that, it's maybe easier to just visualize um, a player's balance over time. So you'll see that there is variance. People will win, but eventually if they keep playing, they will eventually lose all their money <coughs> because the casino always has that edge. And if you keep playing, eventually statistics will catch up with you. So that's um, where I want to leave with this topic. I've told you about a basic casino game, and I've warned you about those near misses. If it feels as you're close to winning money, you're not close to winning money. Just make sure that you're aware of that. Um, the next topic, it's maybe a bit more technical, is how I want to look at how we learn from events. So like I told you earlier, we inherited like a legacy code base. And it basically it looked like this. It was a monolithical application and a big ball of mud. It had ORMs in it, which can be OK. But the entities, they were generated out of Excel. OK? So it was the code base. It, yeah, it really sucked. But what we would notice with this approach, with that monolith, is that our builds were becoming were slow, tests were slow, we had a lot of merge conflicts, which was a pain. But most importantly, we had all of these models inside that big ball of mud, and keeping those models clean was very hard. I mean, you needed to have a lot of discipline to keep them separated. And just putting those models in different physical boundaries can solve that issue because it becomes very hard to touch those other models because there will be a contract between those other contexts. So we wanted to evolve into something that looked more like this. We wanted to take that big ball of mud and maybe try to make it a bit smaller. And we were at the same time adding new functionality and so on. And what we noticed is that a lot of our functionality was reactive. Um, and with that, I mean that something happens here and another thing outside of that boundary reacts to it. Like, oh, I need to send an email or I need to check if this player, if, if I can give him bonus or whatever. So events were a natural <coughs> fit for that. It communicates very clearly what happened. The problem, though, is that we had that stateful model, meaning you have your database, you take some state out of your database, you put that inside of your aggregate, you mutate that state and you put it back. So we had no idea of what happened to that aggregate or what happened in our domain, what happened in our system. So it was, we were aware of event sourcing, we had a bit of experience with it, but moving to event sourcing would be a whole, quite an investment. It's a whole paradigm shift and one, and one we couldn't afford at that time. So we went for a hybrid approach where we now have a stateful model which will use event sourcing techniques to record events. So for example, you have an aggregate, you send the command to that aggregate, it will also internally raise an event, you apply that to your state, and you will persist your state plus those events. So as an example, let's say that you have a player and this player has a certain state Given that you register this player, when you log that player, you get that state, which says this player is locked, plus you have that set of events, which tell you what exactly happened to that player. And it's not an approach I would do on a greenfield project, probably, because it does come with some pain. I mean, you can write tests and you can make sure that your code is in sync, 
But the problem is that with persisting state and events, what if one of them is wrong? You lost your, you don't know what the truth is anymore. And this is a bit of a problem. We, we've worked around that by being vigorously testing everything, but it still has potential to go wrong. But I feel as if, if you can't do event sourcing, this is the next best thing and it, you can apply it to a legacy code base. <coughs> so, so we got into the habit of thinking about events. And although I had experience with event, sort, uh, event storming and so on, when it came down to the technical bits, I would always visualize events vertically. So I would think of events being appended to an event store or events being appended to a log file or even reading uh, event definitions to read them vertically, which is basically wrong because when you go to school and you're like 13 or 14, you get your first real history lessons and they will teach you how to reason about things happening over time in a horizontal chronological fashion. And then they will tell you, you can look for a correlation, you can make a hypothesis on causation and we're very good about reasoning about things happening over time in a horizontal fashion. So to make this thing stronger, I started playing with extra visualizations. So I took the event store and I visualized it over this timeline. And this doesn't show us anything interesting. You do see those peaks, but we could explain those. Those are days when there were campaigns and there, the system was doing a lot of things. Um, that's something I learned as well as uh, when you're a gambling business, you're basically like a marketing machine. A lot of effort goes towards marketing, both from a business perspective and from domain perspective. So things got more interesting for us when we filtered those events and we said, now let's only look at the events which are the result of direct user interaction. And we now see a steady growth, which was good news. Um, we then said, what if we now group these events by day of the week and hour of the day? And then we got to something like this. And this was showing us when people were really using our system. At first, we were looking at Google Analytics, which talks about page views and which is very different from real activity in your system. You would say, why don't you just look at the commands which are sent to your domain? Well, you can do that. The problem is that I can send 1,000 commands and all of them will be rejected because I have no money on my balance. Those events, they tell us what really happened. Even more interesting to us, is what if we now take one type of events? Let's say the online de deposit completed event. We see that same growth. The more players, the more deposits you will have, of course. But even more interestingly, what if we now take another type of events? Let's say bonus awarded. And this correlation is pretty obvious. The more bonuses you award, the more deposits you will have. So that was like some sort of insight. We need to be have a clean bonus system which doesn't cost us too much money, but it's a great tool to give people incentives to make a deposit. So the point I'm trying to make here is that with events, you basically get a time series for free. Meaning that you can look at trends, you can look at correlation and maybe <coughs> make hypotheses about possible causation. But also interesting for us is looking at, at anomalies. We're all quite familiar with the domain and how um, the domain behaves in production, but let's say that we ship a new feature which changes how bonus, bonuses are converted to cash. We deploy this and we see in our monitor that all of a sudden there are a lot of um, bonus to cash conversions. And we found out that there were three to four people who found a bug in our system. They were abusing the model. So we got to fix that real quick, but just because we saw those anomalies and we didn't have to wait for the next day to see a report. But also seasonality is interesting. If you're uh, into marketing, for example, we see that, for example, in summer, activity goes down, but in winter, people start playing more. It's colder, they, they're inside. They maybe have a, lot of, uh, a bit more money um, in December because they get extra pay in December. 
that's the time when you want to ramp up your marketing budget. So that's one thing. The, the next ex experiment is what if we now look at a single stream? We take this single stream, this single aggregate out of our database, and we, have, and we visualize that. So for example, this is the withdrawal request aggregate. And what I see here is that ADM, this withdrawal request was opened, and it was approved at 11 AM. So what I see here is I, I see this language. I see how this aggregate, this stream, behaves in production. I implicitly see that state machine behind this aggregate. But what I also see is I see a thin timeline which isn't too lengthy. So it looks like a very healthy aggregate. So basically, and I'm quoting Cyril here. He did me that favor earlier. Um, this is living documentation at its, at its finest. You can take an aggregate, you can look at it, you can talk uh, about it. You have that language there, those ubiquitous events, and you can talk about its behavior with your domain expert or with another developer. But also, looking at it this way can serve as debugger for your domain. So. When, you, when I started doing domain-driven design, I first focused on the tactical aspect. So I started <laughs> modeling my aggregates. And the problem or the mistake a lot of people make is that their aggregates are just too large, which causes a set of issues. Von Vernon wrote about that in his, I think it's called Designing Aggregates or something. It's a great paper. You need to Google it, um, where it says, <coughs> Big aggregates, they can cause performance problems. For example, if you need to load half of your database inside of your aggregate, that's not going to be fast. The same problem applies for events. If you need to rebuild an event stream, which is 3 billion events, that will be slow as well. And that's something we can't really afford in our domain. Because people play like this. They, plays, they play like uh, 10 games a minute or something. Um, but also, when it comes to concurrency, if you have large aggregates, there might be multiple people trying to change or trying to touch that aggregate at the same point in time. And you don't want to corrupt your data or override any changes. So what you would do is you could do um, pessimistic concurrency where you log the whole thing, which will cause a performance problem. Or you could have optimistic concurrency where you will basically throw errors in someone's face, which is also not great. So two large aggregates, you want to try to split them up to split them up. It's not always possible, but you want to look at it. There's potential there. So there were a few jokes about this last year or two years ago. Your aggregates are so big that they have after commit parties. There's one, another one. Your aggregates are so big, by the time the transaction returns, Composer has finished installing dependencies. <laughs> or this one, I like this one, uh, one as well. Your aggregates are so big, your sharding strategy is per instance. So you get the point, right? Um, we found one of those aggregates inside of our system. And this was the bonus code aggregate. And a bonus code aggregate is something that we can hand out. People can come over, use that bonus code, and they can redeem it. And they basically get something for free, or they get a reduction or so. And how this was implemented, there, there's a set of invariants here. For example, each user can only redeem a bonus code once. It can only be redeemed like 30 times, for example. It has a limited validity. And all of these invariants live inside of this bonus code. So these bonus codes, they tend to go viral because people get free stuff, and they're all for free stuff, is that you would have 100 people touching that aggregate at the same time. So someone would make a change, the other one was making a change, and things would blow up constantly because we would end up with corrupted data. So looking at this, what I see here, it's this aggregate is not long-lived, which is good, but it's very fat. It doesn't look very healthy. There's a lot of contention on this aggregate. So how we solved that is we introduced a new concept. We said there is a bonus code 
redemption. And we can check that whether a customer already uh, redeemed that bonus code. We still have that bonus code aggregate, but that now kind of serves as a factory. It will make decisions whether or not we can create this bonus code redemption. For example, um, we will take a bit of data out of the read model to see how often a bonus code has been redeemed. And we can be wrong, but it's not that expensive to give out one or two bonus code, bonus code redemptions too many. So that's not really a problem. But what we ended up is with a model that still short lived, but there can be concurrency. It scales pretty nicely. There is no need to lock this thing down or to have any sort of uh, optimistic or pessimistic concurrency. It, it scales nicely. So the point I'm trying to make with these visualizations is they can serve as a way of talking about things. You look at behavior in production, plus you can look for smells. Where is this aggregate or the stream very fat, long lived? Maybe I need to reconsider the true invariance and break this thing up so that my system performs nicer and we have smaller aggregates. So the next logical step, of course, is to look at a cluster of streams. Because these aggregates, it's not necessarily relations, but they have references to one another. If I have a player in our system, they, they will start doing things, and all of these things are coupled to each other. And we do a bit of correlation, and that, that is how we eventually ended up looking at a player. Let's, for example, look at this player, Jeff. He has a few activity days in February. Uh, it's basically looking at the same visualization, but now we're zooming out. We can then zoom in, and we get something that looks like this. I know you can't read it, but I will zoom in in a minute. Um, and this is actually how we ended up discovering about different types of players. Uh, we, we look at player behavior in this fashion, and we extracted quite some knowledge from this. So let me zoom in here. So for example, you have player Jeff. He registered. He then logged on. He registered, which opened his account. Um, because he opened an account, we will give him a deposit bonus. He claimed this deposit bonus, which started the online deposit. The story continues. His online deposit completed, which deposited on his account, and he then starts placing bets. So this gives us a quite a complete and nice story. You see causation, correlation. Um, and he places bets until his account is extinct. What's special is that it's only 10 bets or so. But let's look at another day for the same player. Zooming in again, we see the same thing. He makes a deposit, he <coughs> places bets, but he now he won a bet. And he immediately requests a withdrawal. And this opens a withdrawal request. So what's special about this user is if, if we were comparing users and we see that he makes a deposit and he only places 10 bets. So his stake is pretty high if you compare it with his deposit amount. And if you then look a bit further, is you'll see that he plays very aggressive games like jackpot games where the jackpot is 1 million, meaning that you put in a lot of money, your payout will be low, but you're hoping for a big win. And then this also makes sense, because if he wins one of those, he will immediately request a withdrawal. So these are the type of players that we call action players. They are not out to waste their time, maybe to waste their money, but they're really looking for action. For them, it's like a lottery, which they can just um, go online and play the lottery a little bit. They don't expect much return, but if they have return, it will be a, a big win. So there are different kind of, uh, kinds of players. The next one is player Christine. And she has a few more activity days. There's like a certain trend going on here, or a certain pattern. And if you zoom in, her timeline looks completely different. She makes two deposits, number one, number two, and she places a lot of bets until her account is extinct. And 
if you dive a bit deeper, deeper into the data, you'll see that her cash out ratio is basically 0%. So these aren't players that are out to win a lot of money, but even if they win money, they just use it to extend their life on the machine. So if you look at their cash out ratio, it's very low. Um, they place a lot of bets, so they play low stakes, and they're there to waste their time. They're not looking for money, they're just using it as a way to escape and to turn off their brain for a little while. In the same way that people look at television just to not have to think of anything. So these type of players are escape players. And then we have one more type, which is player David. He has two activity days, so he hardly ever logs on. And if he logs on, we immediately detect fraud. And this is one of the biggest challenges or one of the biggest problems online. You can have one million clients and 95% will be people trying to abuse the casino because your identity, it's, it's trivial online. People will, they will sign up, they will try to take advantage of all sorts of bonuses. They will open Smurf accounts. Basically, you have an existing account, but you create one next to that. Maybe you use the identity of your husband or the identity of your wife, and now you get two um, you, you will get promotions twice, basically. So that's, that's not really a problem. Um, physical casinos have that much, but online it's really problematic, actually. Um, so we call those guys um, advantage players. They're out to cheat the casino, and these are the ones who try to shut down as soon as possible because they're not there to lose money. Um, so how does all of this relate to evil by design? I mean, I've, I've showed you how we reason about things, but you also see all that potential data. And then it really depends on how you put that data to use. So for example, let's, see, let's say that we have a player, we know that he's an action player and he's churning, he hasn't played in a while. What we then will do is we, will, we might have a new jackpot game or something. We will send them like targeted advertising and we'll say, look at the size of this jackpot. You need to log in again, make a deposit, and maybe you will win two million. So that's one way to use that. Or for example, if you look at escape players, players who, who are not really out to win, but players you want to keep, or customers you want to keep, um, you'll see that they run out of money and then you will look at the payout of the last session and you'll see that they had a bad experience, for example. Their payout was only 30%. So what you can then do is to look at her lifetime value and say, okay, she already, they already, she already spent quite a lot of money. She's a good customer. Let's give her something for free so that she can play longer and she has a good feeling so she, that she had value for her money. Now, the final thing I want to talk about today are how I feel about the ethics of this domain. Um, at first, <laughs> when, I, when I joined the company, I was a bit weary of what people would say or what they would think of me because gambling has still a very bad reputation in Belgium. And I was surprised that a lot of people actually told me like, dude, you're just a programmer, you're just the one typing code, it's not your problem. Those typing code won't hurt anyone else. No, I don't really buy that. I mean, if I spend eight hours a day, five days a week working on something, contributing to something, I should at least have some idea of what I'm contributing to. So if I look at the models I've contributed to in the last two years, I do consider them as evil. For example, um, if you look at games, you have classic games like roulette where you have 37 um, po box, uh, pockets, and if your ball lands in one of those pockets, you will get your stake multiplied by 36. So it's very obvious that you're playing against the casino and the casino has an edge. So that's actually a pretty simple, open, transparent game. If you look at the latest things like those slot machines and how they are manipulated to make, to make it immersive, addictive 
experience where they basically lie like you're close to winning, that's a bit more evil, I think. The same way if you look at marketing, and this is not only the case for gambling, far from it, you look at their behavior and you come up with this evil language like expected lifetime value. You don't look at them as people anymore. You just look at them as resources which have a potential to bring in money. And that's not a language you would directly use with your customer because they would not be very happy with that, I think. I mean, if I tell a customer, oh, your expected lifetime value is only this high, so I can't really give you another promotion, that's a bit evil. So classifying an evil and a good model, I look at evil models as most of the time they're closed. You're, you try to hide that model from your customer. And if you can't hide it, you basically create a new language. You create a new artificial model where, or just a model surface and you hide some of the details or some of the important bits of the model. You try to hide that from your customer. On the other hand, I do feel as if I've contributed to good models. I mean, how we handle a customer's uh, money or when it comes to bonuses, we've really put an effort into making that a good model, which is clean, where people won't feel uh, abused using that model. But also we have explicit tools which say um, gambling can be addictive if you know that you might have a problem with gambling, we will give you a certain set of tools like set, um, you can configure a withdrawal limit. Let's say that you will only withdraw 100, oh, a deposit limit, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's a difference. <laughs> they won't be very happy with a withdrawal limit. Uh, a deposit limit, let's say that you can only want to spend 100 euros this month. That's fine for us. We're okay. We, respect your decision and we will give you the tools to control yourself. So good models are open, they're easy to understand and they're ubiquitous. Meaning that the customer, the software, me and the stakeholders, we all talk the same language and we don't need to hide things from our customers. That should be a good model. So if I look at the industry at large, I do see some evil models. I see some good models, but there's this constant friction and compared to what people think casinos are not out to destroy people's lives they basically they feel as if they're selling entertainment which is true but there's always this potential that it becomes a problem and a casino would much rather have 1,000 happy social customers than to have 10 customers <laughs> who will destroy their lives spending money they don't have so as a programmer I there are some evil models. If I look at those <coughs> games, we don't control that. That's, I can't influence that. But there are models like marketing and bonuses and so on, which I've contributed to, and where I've consciously made a decision to make those models good, meaning open, simple to use, and ubiquitous. So I try to contribute in that way. Um, but also, I see a lot of potential. We as programmers, developers, we can do more than just write code. We can do more than just influence the models. For example, if I look at why people get addicted or they grow compulsion towards gambling, there are a few reasons. There are books written about this. Um, for example, is how you're wired, how your brain is wired. There's ignorance. People don't know how chance works over time. There's when people have emotional problems, they will always search for an escape, whether that's gambling, drinking, drugs, video games, television, whatever really. They will always search for something where they can turn off their brain and, search and have an easy escape. So going over these things, the first one is a bit hard to change. I can't tweak anyone's brain, but it comes together a bit with number two. Um, for me personally, I feel as if doesn't matter if you're working for Amazon who conveniently sends you emails because you've looked at a certain item so they try to get one more sale out of you or whether it's Facebook who's trying to make you addicted to the interactions with their app and trying to get more data so that they can serve you more relevant ads or you're an insurance company always looking at the odds, calculating the odds and 
trying to get as much as an edge as possible, or as if you're a casino selling entertainment and they want to get one more bet out of you. I don't see that much of a difference really. So what I try to do here is we live inside of the bellies of these beasts, these enterprises which use certain tactics and not everyone is aware of that. So I try to be open about that, talk about these things so that people can be informed, they can grow a thicker skin and they can make conscious decisions. All of these tactics aren't bad per se, I mean it's kind of the result of the economical system we live in, I think. Um, but if, as long as people are aware of those things, it should be okay. Now the third thing, emotional problems. We can go ahead and solve people's problems, as, uh, not always anyways. Um, and I like to quote this experiment they did one or two years ago. Um, it's where they put a rat inside of a cage and inside of this cage were two bottles of water. So one was normal water and the other one was water with drugs in it. Now if this rat was by itself, it would take a sip of that water with the drugs in it and it would eventually become addicted to the drugs and it would have the result that the rat died. So they repeated that experiment, so they made a bigger cage, they put more rats inside of that cage so that those rats could be social. They gave those, uh, they put those bottle of, bottles of water in there as well. And what they would now see is that those rats would still sometimes take a sip of that water with their drugs in it, but they wouldn't become addicted. They would see it like a vice or something, but it wouldn't cause them to die anymore. Meaning that if you have a social healthy environment, certain of those vices are okay. And as a person, as a human, I try to contribute to that as well, meaning that I'll try to be open, social, hoping that my friends or my family, that they don't need to escape into something material, like gambling on, or so on, and then they can just escape to other people. And that those things, those things considered evil, like drinking, it's not evil, uh, casinos are not evil, all of those things are okay in their certain context, as long as they don't become an escape or an escape from reality, really. So concluding, I do think that we're not just programmers. We can make a difference by influencing these models. We can't influence every model, but we do make a difference and these small changes can make things better. But also as a human, we know quite a lot of things. So we should contribute to that and make everyone more aware so that they make, can make conscious decisions. So like I told you earlier, I'm not sure if I'm already corrupted after these two years, um, but feel free, there's, I'm not sure when every, everyone's leaving, but I'm here tonight and there will be beer, I guess. What do you think of the ethics of this domain? And I'd, like to, I'd really like to have your opinion on that. So thank you for being here, thank you for your attention. <laughs>